but I think you get you you get your invite and then you you don't necessarily get a chance to go back. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna click the go live button. Hey, before you do that, could you split where I'm not seeing me and your screen because I see my delay I, and it's like throwing I, my brain off. Yeah, I so, sorry. I, I just clicked the live button. I. I I can't do that because this is what, so if, if you want to sort of not have one that's confusing you, I recommend like minimize the zoom window or put like a window in front of it or, ah, gotcha. or put like a half window so that you're only seeing me. So I won't, I won't change the frame and that way, but I have to, unfortunately it doesn't let me like, this is the view that's going out to the audience and I can, I can feed this view to you, but I can't feed like just a straight up camera, a different view to you, unfortunately yet. So maybe okay. at some point in the, in the far future, they'll figure okay. out the technology. Maybe it's, maybe it's good that I can see that view so I can at least see if I, you know, <laughs> do something like that. I'll go, Oh, wait a minute. So it's yeah. probably good. I do that. You yeah. Know, then, you, up. then you'll start directing yourself and now nah, it'll <laughs> just cause mayhem. But, um, all right, let's, uh, well, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of universe today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. Normally, I'm bringing you the news and answering your questions, but I also like to bring you behind the scenes with the experts who are actually making the news. And today, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Harold Sonny White. Dr. White, how's it going? Hey, hey how's it going, Fraser? Good to see you today. Yeah, good, good to see to, you again. Good to see you again, too. Um, so I get the question I always ask people is, who are you? What do you do? Um, my name is Sonny White. Uh, I'm the Director of Advanced Research and Development here at uh, Limitless Space Institute. Um, prior to that, I was at NASA for almost 20 years. Uh, I spent about half of that working flight robotics, so I spent a lot of time on console building the International Space Station. Um, and then I spent the second half of that uh, really focused on advocating for advanced power and propulsion, which is really kind of my passion, which is, of course, what led me to come here and join uh, LSI. Uh, in terms of background, educational, uh, you know, I've got my master's in mechanical engineering, uh, and I have a PhD in physics. Um, my favorite color is blue, and I like poetry, right? Okay. There you go. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'll stop you at this point. Um, but so, so look, before we talk about limitless space, which is what you're working on right now, I'd love to talk a bit about, about your history at NASA and what, and what sort of got you so excited about this. So I mean, your background is very much traditional NASA engineer aerospace, but also that the PhD in in physics. Is that a, a traditional sort of capability of a of a NASA engineer? Uh, well, you know, it, in, in the process of thinking about what I wanted to get my uh, PhD in when I was at that bifurcation point, um, I always had a strong interest in advanced power and propulsion, and I always had this uh, this interest in general relativity, right? And so in the process of kind of looking at the road I had to go through to get the PhD uh, in terms of the classes I had to take, it just really seemed to make a lot more sense to go ahead and switch gears and do physics instead of uh, uh, mechanical engineering. Now, I mean, there was a little bit of additional work to go do that, but, you know, it was where my passion was, and it was, I think it was time for the, the switch, right? And it, and it it definitely meshed very well with my interest, right? The, you, you, you've probably seen, I've done some stuff in the past on uh, the idea of the of, of space warp and, and some other things like that. And in order to kind of work in that domain, you have to really understand the language, right? And so I'd taken a lot of advanced mathematics courses during my graduate studies. And so that kind of, that set me up really well to make that uh, transition a little less painful. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's why I did the physics, and no, it's not necessarily the most common thing in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the engineers. So uh, I definitely have two caps I wear. So it depends yeah. on the given talk to me, right? So, but it is funny because like I get warp drive designs sent to me every <laughs> few weeks, and I'm I'm sure you do too. Yes, and I do. and a lot of the time it's you know like a really cool spaceship, and then there's a box in the middle that says warp drive goes here. And, right, you know, right. and, and when I push warp back, drive thingy. Warp drive thingy, yeah, exactly. You know, and they use some kind of elaborate words, but they don't actually have the math to back it up. And it's the that math that tends to turn science fiction enthusiasts 
into cold realists about the state of the universe and the laws of physics as we understand them. Why? You know, there's, there's no shortcuts in science, right? So. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess what about your education into physics gave you more enthusiasm for the future of space exploration and being able to get faster, you know, ways to move around the universe? Mm, that's that, that's a good question, right? The, the idea of a space warp is is definitely uh, something that's essentially very non-trivial. Uh, but you know, the, the the physics mathematics says it's potentially possible. And we know that uh, you can expand and contract space at any any speed that you want. And we know when we look at uh, uh, astrophysics and cosmology, right? There's this potential inflationary phase of the universe at the very early on that had uh, manifested some of this stuff. So. Uh, potentially nature can do it at a grand scale. Maybe the salient question is, could we ever have any kind of hope of trying to do it on a microscopic scale? Uh, and so the math and physics is kind of what you need to do. You need to uh, explore and understand to try and figure out how much, how much stuff does it take to make something like this work? What type of topology do you need of uh, energy densities? What kind of energy densities do you need? Uh, what kind of tidal forces would that generate? Is it flat space time? Is there tidal forces? Right. And so, I mean, I, I could go on. Right. But uh, there's, and we there's will. We things. will. Yeah. But but I guess, the, I mean, that idea like that, that the that nature has been doing this, like if you went all the way back to the beginning of the universe and you positioned yourself in the inflationary period, what would the universe do to your spacecraft? Like how quickly would it move your spacecraft? Well, there's there's some uh, some. Uh, simple calculations folks have done in the literature kind of looking at if this inflationary phase did occur, what type of uh, effective speeds would, would points have moved away from one another in that initial, that, that balloon with the dots on it that you always see as the balloon yeah. expands, the, the dots move away. And so what do the dots see relative to one another in terms of as their, their buddies are, are moving away from, you know, it, it's at a, a colossally large number, like 10 to the 30th, 10 to the 40th type of uh, uh, times, effectively times the speed of light. Uh, so, you know, instantaneous in effect, right, almost. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, that that's uh, that's potentially what you might have seen if, if you could have been an observer at that particular state, right? But uh, again, that's the universe doing it. That's not us doing it. Right, of course, of course. But but in theory, if the universe can do it, then, then it might be within, within our reach. So... Talk about sort of your discovery of the Alcubierre drive idea and how that transformed your thinking on the matter. Well, you know, I, I ran into the paper shortly after he published it. Uh, uh, I think at the time I was working up in uh, Wichita, Kansas at Boeing. Um, and uh, that, that, you know, that paper, ironically, that the when I started reading through that paper, I was like, I really need to get a little bit better at my, my tensor calculus. And so <laughs> I was pursuing my master's at the time. And so I took a graduate course in tensor calculus, took a whole bunch of advanced mathematics courses and uh, that continued to help me kind of unpack the concept. Um, and so my, my awareness of the model that uh, Miguel Acubier created. And so, you know, th just to give listeners that may not be familiar uh, Miguel Acubier is another physicist that uh, was interested in the idea of a space warp, right? If, if, if you can expand and contract space at any particular speed, what's the math that's necessary to make that uh, something close to what we what we think about when we watch some of the, the science fiction shows? And so he, he authored a paper with a model that uh, described a spaceship that kind of looks like maybe something over my shoulder, oops, the other side, the, over the shoulder there, you've got... Uh, uh, some kind of a spacecraft with the, the, the central bits on the inside and then those, those topological rings that uh, would have to be filled with something called exotic matter uh, in general relativity. And so, you know, you published a paper in the, in the 90s and I, I worked with it for a while. I, I published a paper in 2003 where I put it into canonical form uh, in, uh, I think it was uh, general, general Relativity and Gravitation Journal. Um, but uh, just kind of exploring some of the, the more interesting subtleties of the metric. Um, but I think uh, the, maybe the stuff that I've done that folks might be familiar with is I did some work in 2009, 10, and 11 when we had the DARPA NASA 100-Year Starship Symposium. Uh, they asked me to come give a talk on the idea of a space warp, and I, I didn't want to just kind of repeat stuff I had done before. <clears throat> I wanted to... Uh, Kind of bring some new stuff, and I, I did a sensitivity analysis of the field equations, kind of turned some of the knobs and the mathematics, and figured out 
Uh, are there any mechanisms that we could potentially employ to reduce the amount of exotic matter that's necessary to make the trick uh, possible, right? Uh, uh, as you're probably full aware, uh, prior to that work that I did in 2009-10 timeframe, the uh, estimations for the amount of exotic matter, we'll talk about what that is in just yep. a second, the amount of exotic matter that's necessary to make the trick work was oh, about the size of Jupiter, which, you know, means that it's... Uh, mathematically possible, but we'll never do it, right? Um, and so uh, I wanted to go through and kind of explore that uh, that limit and see if I could find some ways to improve on that. And so, uh, and that limit was, that calculation was done by Richard Lucy uh, in the literature. And so the work that I did for DARPA NASA 100 Year Starship Symposium, I, I figured out if you change the, in my, my polarity, right, the, change the thickness of the rings, uh, they're on the, the spaceship over my, uh, over my shoulder there, make them thicker, you can reduce the, I'm going to use an engineering term, uh, you could reduce the strain that you have to put, three-dimensional strain that you have to put on space-time. And so that reduces the amount of exotic matter non-trivially. And so I was able to build a, a toy spacecraft that had Jupiter amount of exotic matter, and then uh, turning those knobs, I was able to reduce that to something a little bit bigger than the Voyager 1 spacecraft in terms of overall exotic matter mass. So that moves the idea from... I would say impossible to at least maybe plausible. I, I right. don't know that it says anything about feasibility. Yet, right. right. Well, that's I guess the next issue is just this idea of exotic matter because so so what what is exotic matter? Right. And and so before I answer that, let me uh, let me set up the answer with a, a quick Venn diagram. I want to do uh, if you if you envision our knowledge of physics as a Venn diagram. Uh, there are two circles that are on this Venn diagram. Make sure I get this. I know you got the split screen here. So you got two circles on the Venn diagram and they touch at a, a single tangent point. And in one circle, uh, you've got the words quantum mechanics and that represents our understanding of the microscopic world, right? You know, cell phones work because of that. Uh, and the other circle, we have the words general relativity and that represents our understanding of the macroscopic world, how the sun, stars, cosmos uh, move and evolve. And so <clears throat> that kind of sets up a background where in general relativity, exotic matter is defined as negative mass, right? And it's it's not like we have, uh, you know, a, a nice cylindrical tank with the words acne on it, and we can go, you know, acne exotic matter, and we can pour that into a spacecraft, and Wiley Coyote can go zipping off after Roadrunner at, uh, at warp speed, because we, we don't know how to make negative mass in the context of general relativity, right? I mean, there might be people that are still trying to think about it, but it's definitely an, an issue. The Alcubia warp metric violates a number of the energy conditions. Uh, uh, however, in quantum mechanics, there is this other phenomenon that we call negative vacuum energy density. Uh, and this is something that we can make manifest in something called a Kasner cavity. We can talk about that in just a minute. Sure. Yep. Uh, but the mathematical characteristics of negative vacuum energy density kind of look and uh, seem like uh, exotic matter in general relativity. And so that's a potential proxy that's been talked about in the literature as a substitute for uh, general relativity's exotic matter. And point in fact, Alcubierre in his paper in 1994 highlighted that as a potential uh, way to satisfy the, the, the requirements of the metric. So, I mean, I guess like, but like what, what kind of, you know, you mentioned that there's, I guess, a couple of pathways that you could get to exotic matter potentially, um, but what would it, how would it behave like if we had a Voyager sized blob of exotic matter, something with negative mass in the universe? How would it how would it behave? Well, I mean, if you took the just some of the conceptual things, if you could put two two <clears throat> potatoes or positive mass and negative mass, they would potentially just accelerate continually away from one another. And so that's why general relativity is like we don't know exactly how to make something like that manifest because it doesn't make sense to us. Uh, but but in, it would, in, I mean, I guess like I'm sort of thinking like if it was if it was if we're thinking electromagnetically, then you could have two things which have the same charge. They would repel each other. Two things with opposite charges would attract each other. And in this case, mm -hmm. you would have the gravitational version of mm -hmm. of gravity repelling each other. Mm -hmm. right. right. Why? Why is that the key to to making this concept so powerful? That's a great question. Right? It, uh, you know, it, I think, it, and this has always been something that uh, 
I've been curious about when you look at the idea of uh, the Okubir work metric, right? It's um, uh, there is a, a ring of negative vacuum energy density or a ring of exotic matter that uh, exists around the spacecraft. Um, but it's uh, it's symmetric about the uh, the the like the, the center line of that uh, that ring, if you will. Uh, there's no asymmetry to it in terms of the uh, the, the distribution of, of energy density, right? And so that was actually some of the motivation for the work that I did in 2003, where I put the Alcubierre you know, work metric in the canonical form, because uh, I was trying to figure out. I mean, how does you know your choice of positive x for the spacecraft is arbitrary? So you know, what does that even mean? And so putting it into canonical form uh, helped me potentially see that uh, maybe there's some additional uh, subtleties to how the idea works, where uh, a spacecraft has to establish some, it has to undergo real acceleration to establish an initial velocity vector, so let's say relative to heliocentric frame. And then uh, it turns on this, uh, uh, this system that can generate or manifest this uh, negative vacuum energy density in, in some apparatus that we, we, we don't know how to build, but uh, uh, to manifest this, and then it uh, augments the effective velocity where it looks like it's going faster, right? So a, a terrestrial analog I've used in uh, discussions in the past is, um, you know, think about when you're at an airport, and a lot of the airports we go to are really big, uh, and in order to try and help people move along quicker between gates, uh, they have those little horizontal conveyor belts or travelators, right, that you can step onto and <clears throat> it'll speed you up as you as you go on your way. Um, and <clears throat> as you're as you're walking along without being on the belt, you're moving along at about three miles an hour. That's typically how we walk. And so if somebody is sitting on a chair watching you as you're walking, uh, they see you walking at three miles an hour. And as soon as you step onto the belt, right, it looks like you're going faster. And to them, it looks like you're going six miles an hour. But technically, you're still walking three miles an hour, right? Because your right. local frame, you're at your initial unperturbed state. Now, think about what's going on with the belt. Technically speaking, the belt is contracting space in front of you because the belt's moving underneath, right? And this is remember, this is just an analog, right? So the, the belt is contracting space in front of you and expanding space behind you because the belt's moving back around, right? And so uh, that the looking at the Okubia work metric from the, from the canonical point suggests that maybe there's some additional subtleties to try and understand how the mechanism works when you turn it on and, and turn it off. And so having that negative vacuum energy density around the spacecraft sets up this bubble, right, uh, such that uh, <clears throat> potentially even the expansion and contraction of space, maybe that's not catalytic, right? In other words, it's not the expansion and contraction of space that makes the trick work. It's the bubble moving through space, right, and space-time piles up in front, it contracts, and space time stretches out behind it, it expands, right? So, uh, and that's a that, that's a, that's still a debate to be resolved. We, we, right. we don't right. have a clear answer on that. Right? So, uh, but the in short, the math requires negative vacuum energy density to work. Right. right. The the spacecraft over your shoulder, um, and for the people who are listening to this podcast version, it very much looks like the like something like the Enterprise matched with something from 2010 with <laughs> giant rings around it. Uh, it looks very much like science fiction. Mm. How does, and I think that's sort of informing and inspiring people. You're saying, mm. you know, this thing that you love, Star Trek, the Orville, Star Wars, it's possible that we could make this real and this fever dream of being able to fly from star to star or galaxy to galaxy mm -hmm. could actually be possible in a human mm -hmm. lifetime. How does the reality of the journey compare and contrast to our pre-established science fiction fantasy of what it would be like? Because we met, you know, because like Star Trek is actually people on boats going from going from island to island. It's not space travel. Yeah. It's an analogy. And they, and, they, and they fly and navigate and do all kinds of neat things, right? Yeah, yeah, it's an analogy. Yeah. And yeah. and and so the spacecraft that you're showing is definitely informed by that fantasy, that analogy. So what would the reality be like, do you think? Uh, well, you know, um, we working at NASA, I spent a lot of time trying to integrate uh, things like electric propulsion into human space flight. Uh, and in some cases, it took a little while, right? A lot of stakeholders in human spaceflight are used to thinking about chemical propulsion. Uh, and so electric propulsion is a little different in 
And so for the folks that are listening that may not be familiar with what's like ion propulsion. engines. Oh, they are ion engines. Yeah. All thrusters, ion engines, you're ionizing a gas and you're yep. accelerating it with electromagnetic fields. Uh, but the thrust levels are very, very low compared to what we might typically think of when it comes to chemical propulsion. So, uh, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a whole other zip code. And it's very different from what we look at in when we see things in, in uh, science fiction shows. Um, uh, I joke that if, if shows like Star Trek really kind of acknowledged what some of the performance limits might really be, uh, when they were on the bridge and they said, take evasive maneuvers, right? The captain might take a small cup of tea and, you know, I'm going to go to my room and take a nap. Call me when we've moved a little bit, right? right. So it, the thrust levels are very different. It's not like they just, or, or uh, it, I think the, you know, the expanse tries to um, uh, salute uh, as much math and physics as they can of the idea of, of fusion propulsion. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, 5G, you can really build up an enormous amount of speed in a short period of time. Uh, I'm just, it's amazing to me that, that I, the amount of power that's necessary to make 5G. Yeah, you'd be going possible. light speed in about a month, maybe two months, right. which is crazy. Right. And, you know, like, I know, like 1G acceleration for a year gets you to the speed of light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the same thing. I mean, I mean, you know, we can definitely talk about the expanse and it's the same thing, which is like they definitely cover a lot of the physics nicely. But again, warp in their case, Epstein drive, high power fusion drive that can mm -hmm. seemingly have limitless amounts of of propulsion goes here. And yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah. so I mean, it's, like, it's great. It's great for storytelling. Right. It's right. Great exactly. For storytelling. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny you mentioned this. This gets into even some of the things I struggle with when I when I watch uh, uh, TV shows and movies because I have to remind myself this is an artistic way of trying to tell a story, yes. right? Um, so, like concepts of docking, right, or maneuvering. Um, when when spacecraft dock or maneuver, they do things in the movies a million times quicker than we would ever do them uh, in actual practice, right? Having sat on console as we built the space station. And, sat on console through countless numbers of, of docking and EVAs, uh, we're a little bit more calculating and uh, methodical and meticulous about what that looks like. But I guess that wouldn't be conducive to a, a TV show or something like that. So maybe maybe that's something just when folks watch these shows, just recognize, right, that they're, they're having to compress things for time. And I think they do that because maybe it looks cool right. if something – you know, navigates through some tiny little gap or something. So, but I mean, all of these are are well within the laws of physics. The docking ships together, attempting to take evasive maneuvers at sublight speeds, um, transporting your crew to and from your spacecraft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these are all very complicated engineering challenges. But the one <clears throat> that we switch over into the flights of fancy is when you kick in the quantum drive, the warp drive, and <clears throat> you begin traveling through space. How would, again, sort of like the predictions made by Alcubier turn into a practical experience of taking this journey? Um, you know, it's, <clears throat> I, I think I'm tracking what you're trying to ask me. I'm not sure. Um, like, would you see uh, the stars go by as little blobs? Okay. As you're, you know, okay. would you see this crazy halo in front of you and and you know still have time as you're in transit from star system to star system yeah. like i'm trying to think i, get, I got you yeah I, yeah you know it's funny I, I think some calculations have been done to go through and solve for you know what it might look like if you're if you're inside the if you're inside the bubble what would the no like geodesics look like uh, as you as you move through space uh and so i think you would see uh, obviously potentially some of the stars on the front part of the hemisphere of your you know like out of the, the forward viewing or to whatever you're on, you might see some stars, but out the back, you're not, it's going to be uh, black. You won't be able to see anything coming up from behind because you will be effectively moving out, moving any no like geodesics because the bubbles actually moving quicker than the no like geodesics. Right. Uh, so I, I think there's some interesting uh, stuff that's been published and some animations that have been put online to show what it looks like inside the bubble and what it looks like if the bubble were to move between you know, you and a planet. So you can kind of see the, the lensing effect right. uh, as the, uh, the little warp bubble moves across and you see it bending the, the light rays. And then what is like the theoretical speed? Because I, like I've heard in some calculations, it's instantaneous to go halfway across the observable universe. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the speed for the idea of a space warp 
right? So you would, I mean, it's just a number you plug into the calculations, right? So, uh, you know, it's funny, the, the work that I did in, in 9, 10, and 11, uh, I did a little toy spacecraft that was uh, 10 meters in diameter, and it had an effective velocity of, of 10C. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the, in the press uh, said 10C is the speed limit. Like, well, that was just a choice of a number in the metric that had nothing to do with the, the upper limit. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the, uh, the upper limit would be something tied to how fast can space expand and contract, right? And I don't know that we know what that would be formally. Right, right. Uh, but shoot, I just I'd be happy with 0.5 C if we had a space warp that could do something like that. But uh, anyway. right, right, right. So that's still unknown. All right, so let's so let's talk about kind of practicalities because I think you know what sets you apart from the people who are sending me their warp drive designs is that you have the resources, you have the knowledge, the experience, and now you have a new organization that you're working mm -hmm. with to try to actually make some of these ideas a reality. So talk about that. What's the organization that you're working with? Yeah, so Limitless Space Institute, we're a nonprofit uh, registered uh, 501c3. Um, you know, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond our solar system and to support the research development of enabling technologies. Our pinnacle objective is to work towards trying and enabling interstellar flight maybe by the end of the century. And so that kind of aligns with some other organizations that have stated the same thing, like Breakthrough Initiatives, for example. Um, and so, you know, when you, <clears throat> when you talk about human exploration of the outer solar system and out of the stars, it's very different from what most folks are familiar with when we talk about space exploration. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of background on that for just a minute. I know we were just talking about space works, but <clears throat> when most folks think about space exploration, they're, they're thinking of uh, uh, SpaceX as putting neat spacecraft in, in low Earth orbit. We're trying to get human beings back to the surface of the moon in the next few years. We have some amazing little rovers uh, that are on the surface of Mars, uh, studying the surface and, and doing some amazing science. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and those missions are incredible, uh, and they were all done effectively with chemical propulsion. Right? You don't necessarily need anything more than that, uh, just so long as you're willing to wait the, the time it takes to get there with the, the chemical propulsion. But if we want to send human beings to the outer solar system, right, and let's say we want to get a human crew to Saturn and we want to get them there in 200 days. Um, the amount of energy that's necessary to make something like that work uh, is an order of magnitude more energy than it takes to get a payload from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit. So, I mean, the delta V is an order of magnitude higher, right? So uh, all that to say chemical propulsion can't uh, close that. That's just not even remotely possible. And so, well, I mean, what are we to do? I mean, is, is all hope lost? Well, we've already talked about uh, in the context of known physics a couple things that would potentially help uh, with that. One is electric propulsion, but you have to plug that in, right? And so if you're looking at sending human beings to the outer solar system, we can't necessarily use something called solar electric propulsion, where we have solar panels that provide electricity uh, uh, from sunlight to some forms of electric propulsion, because, you know, four pi r squared, the, the the amount of power you get per square meter goes down really quickly. Um, but a nuclear electric propulsion uh, spacecraft architecture where you have a power source that's fissioning uranium uh, could provide um, power to the electric thrusters. And that would take us throughout the entire solar system, but wouldn't necessarily do interstellar. Uh, for interstellar, within the context of known physics, right, you were talking about that earlier, is uh, fusion is potentially a way to do it, right? You can get much higher specific impulse, maybe a little bit higher powers and then you can do a, 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 some kind of a mission with a large payload to another star in, in uh, a century kind of time frame. Uh, but if you want to get to another star, uh, another star system in a fraction of human lifetime, that's where I, you know, I, I talked about that Venn diagram of physics. You got those two circles, right? And they benefit us every day in the form of cell phones, GPS, what have you. Uh, but we know there's potentially a bigger circle, uh, of a more fundamental mathematical framework. Uh, and so in the process of doing that, will that help us figure out, you know, what to put into a wrong shoulder, what to put into uh, the, the rings around that spacecraft. And so that's, that's uh, just give me another 60 seconds here. Uh, and so that's kind of the, that's the three swim lanes that uh, we use to view the things that we're interested in uh, as we uh, uh, put uh, rubber to the road with our programs. 
Uh, we have, you know, we, we partner enormously with uh, academia. We have uh, internal research that we do in the Egorics lab. Uh, we've been funded by DARPA to do some work on some custom casimir cavities. Um, we have, we fund external work through our interstellar initiative grants program, LSI grants program. Uh, we funded nine teams over 2020 to 2022 timeframe uh, researching things like beamed energy propulsion, uh, relativistic solar sails. Uh, we did four teams working on fusion propulsion, two on space drives, uh, and then one on uh, tra traversable wormholes. We have a university partnership with uh, Texas A&M to work on a uh, compact nuclear reactor uh, in the one megawatt electric range. Um, and then we have uh, student programs where we have summer classes where people can register for summer classes to learn about uh, what does it take to do interstellar? What does the literature, what does literature have? What have people talked about in the past? Um, uh, we have LSI lab boosters where we partner with high schools uh, to, and middle schools and even elementary schools uh, to do work. So um, thank you for the extra 60 seconds to get that last part out. So we're, you know, we're, we're doing, orga we're a doing organization. You inspire and, you know, inspire, educate research, inspire and educate by doing, right? So, so how, how do you kind of break down? I mean, you, you mentioned that there's like very established technologies that that are proven in space, but are theoretically a lot more capable. You talked about like the nuclear uh, electric propulsion. You know, this idea has definitely been around for a while. It was originally thought that they could use that for the um, a, a Jupiter mission back 10 years ago. Um, and Gmail, they, right? yeah, yeah. And there's still some, some other ideas that are being pr like, probably that's the spacecraft that will carry astronauts to Mars. It'll be some ferry that is traveling between earth and Mars with a nuclear fission engine on board that is providing fairly significant electric propulsion. And then you've got things like solar sails as, as you, as you say, and then you've got the more extreme, but still within the laws of physics ideas that can carry us potentially interstellar beamed, right. uh, you know, laser sails, mm -hmm. antimatter propulsion, fusion drives, et cetera. And mm -hmm. then this, this last component, which is purely theoretical ideas that require breakthroughs in physics to even mm -hmm. be feasible. How right. do you sort of allocate your time or even how does the how does the organization how does limitless break down its efforts into those those areas so it's it's definitely a portfolio right so i kind of highlighted uh, uh, three principal swim lanes right and they're kind of aligned with the context of known physics known engineering uh known physics unknown engineering and then of course unknown physics unknown engineering that's a great way to describe it i like that a lot Right. It, it's, it's, it was a, it was a purpose, purposeful process to trying to communicate a very, very complicated topic uh, to a very broad audience and help them kind of appreciate, you know, how do you kind of bend things and how do you think about things? And so that helps us also kind of uh, establish a, a portfolio. And so we, we kind of uh, put resources in all three, uh, but the, we, you know, we, we don't purposely try and, you know, lens a portfolio one way or another. Uh, you know, the, uh, the LSI grants program is a competitive process and we have external reviewers that we bring in. Uh, and so the, the, the proposals that get funded, it just depends upon how well they're written and how strong the teams are uh, and how compelling the work is, right? So at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the details and there are no shortcuts in science. And so uh, we, we, fund the, we fund the teams that uh, look like they have the most promising ideas. Uh, but we're not we're not opposed to putting some resources into kind of working on the, the frontiers of physics, right? So think about think about the you know, E equals mc squared, right? It was uh, and this this is something that was published in 1905, uh, and then in 1932 we split the first atom. Uh, I think you had the Chicago Pile reactor in 1941 or 42 where they generated a half a watt, and then of course we had the largest energetic display of, of of stuff with e equals mc squared in 1945. Uh, and so that all occurred without computers, without artificial intelligence, without machine learning. Uh, and so we know uh, that there is a deeper understanding that we have yet to figure out. So in the process of kind of looking at the frontiers of physics, right, now that we have some of these additional capabilities, uh, how quickly might we go from an e equals mc squared to some kind of application? And the other thing that you know, I typically think of, especially with the work that we've been doing for DARPA, I think there's going to be a whole lot more uh, terrestrial application, terrestrial applications of the physics insights as we work on those frontiers of physics that have 
you know, nothing to do with this spaceship over my shoulder, if you will, right? To, this may be something that keeps fuel in the tank and keeps us interested and we keep trying to, you know, push back the, the darkness, if you will. Uh, but as we continue to move forward, uh, as we develop potentially deeper insights into the fundamentals of physics, we'll come up with new ways to do transistors. We'll come up with new, maybe new ways to generate new types of radiation that we didn't know we could do because we didn't have the math and phys physics figured out. And so maybe that would have applications for, for medicine or other things that have nothing to do uh, with spaceflight. So I really do believe that uh, uh, that third swim lane, even though it's potentially, you know, uh, really reaching for some amazing concepts, uh, as you continue to make progress, you're going to find a lot more stuff that uh, you can you can do in the near term, long before you get to the this romantic picture, if you will. So, I mean, it sounds very similar to me to NASA's NIAC projects, the NASA Advanced Innovative Concepts Group. Right. How would you kind of compare and contrast? Like, if you were someone with an interesting, innovative space propulsion idea uh -huh. would, you know, right now, the only option is NIAC. Do you sort of provide an alternative pathway for someone to try to get some funding and be able to do some research into that, into that idea? Right. Our LSI grants are an exact mechanism to try and uh, help provide uh, stable funding for folks in academia that have interest in, in these uh, these particular domains. I think, you, and you hit the nail right on the head, right? There's some potential uh, overlap in terms of wanting to look at the, the frontiers of how to do things. Um, NIAC will uh, fund, you know, a, a full spectrum. Every every type of system on the spacecraft, every kind of arc, you know, they have a much broader purview. Uh, with their resources than we do. We're very much focused on trying to solve the time distance problem and the time distance problem alone. Hmm. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, we are definitely laser focused because in, in the, you know, I, I worked human exploration architecture at, at NASA for many, many years and, uh, you know, the stuff that laid the gateway and some other things like that. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, when I look at what's the, what's the real big problem when you want to send human beings to the outer solar system. So all the other systems, they get, resources, there's no necessarily any major, major breakthroughs, really breakthroughs that are necessary. Uh, but when you want to, when you want to really go far out in, in a short period of time, you just, you got to have something that's significant in this power propulsion thing. So it's like the long pole in the tent. That's why LSI is so laser focused on just right. that. And so interestingly enough, right, you know, we, we definitely are, we know a lot of folks in, in the NIAC uh, world and, and you know, they're completely aware of us. And so it's a very, I think uh, it's, it, it's good that we know each other and we chit chat mm -hmm. about what we're doing. So, so how large are the grants that, that you're able to provide people for doing research? We have a, a tactical grant uh, that's a hundred thousand uh, dollars and that's meant to potentially be uh, predominantly focused on, uh, like some type of paper computer, in paper studies, computer analysis. Um, and then we have uh, uh, something called a strategic grant where we're anticipating that some folks might be doing some work in a lab uh, and that can go all the way up to $250,000. Uh, this year, uh, this biennial cycle, so this is something we're doing every two years, this biennial cycle, uh, we've added LSI fellowships where we have two-year graduate fellowships and two-year postdoc uh, fellowships uh, the graduate fellowships are up to 120K total award, uh, and the postdoc fellowships are up to 180K uh, two-year award. Uh, and so those are the, uh, the mechanisms for uh, folks in academia to, to maybe, you know, uh, get something that's right on par with a, a NIAC grant, uh, just with the one caveat, it'll, it'll be focused on uh, the time distance solution. Uh, other things we do, the university partnerships, we, it depends upon who we talk to and, and what they can bring to the table. We're always open to discussions if folks are serious about it. Uh, and then the, the, you know, we've got LSI lab boosters where we're trying to expand our portfolio to at least engage, uh, you know, kiddos in the, in the K through 12 range. And so we're, we're partnering with some amazing teachers in different locations and uh, trying to do that. We have something called LSI lab boosters. Uh, where you can get uh, anywhere from two to 10 K uh, hmm. if you have a, a you know, a, a strong uh, academic uh, focus with some, some kids somewhere in that range. So we're, we're formalizing that process uh, right now. We've got a few already in, in the field that we're doing with, but so we're going to formalize that and build more stuff on our website for that. And what's the source of your funding? 
Uh, we have, so we're a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit. So we, we operate off of donations. We have a primary benefactor uh, and we have a number of other benefactors, but our primary benefactor is uh, Cam Gaffarian. Uh, he is the uh, co-founder of Intuitive Machines, uh, Axiom Space, uh, X Energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he's also invested in General Fusion and he's probably got another 20 some odd companies. I couldn't even begin to tell you, but he's, uh, <laughs> right, but he's right. uh, you know, he, he's one of those guys that's very interested in trying to make you know, make the world a better place. And so his uh, investments kind of trace to that. Right. But just to be clear, he's the guy who just spent $200 million sending four people to the international space station. Well, I guess maybe they, they contributed some money as well and is in the process of building a new module to the space station, et cetera, et cetera. Like he's, has deep pockets. Uh, he's a, you know, yeah, he's, he's, he's definitely, uh, he's been very successful in his efforts at trying to uh, do a good job working in the, in the space program. And he's always been, you know, he's, he's just a good human at heart, if you will. And so it's nice to be able to uh, kind of um, uh, benefit from that big heart that he has and try and put rubber to the road in a meaningful way. Right. So. It's, it's interesting to me, like, you know, I, I often will make fun of <clears throat> the asteroid mining startups because mm-hmm. there's no business model there. Um, they think there is, but the reality is, is that, as you said, our, our actual practical capability of, of exploring space is we're still in, in the infancy. We are decades away from being able to do the kinds of things that they're hoping to do. And that that does not for a successful business model make, right? How, so does this idea of a nonprofit give you kind of inspiration that it's going to be able to go the long term? I mean, you could be at it for a hundred years before some of the really big challenges start to come, become right. clear. Right. You know, let, let me, let me rephrase your question. I, I do, I do get, uh, a lot of pointed questions of, Hey, when are we going to have more dry? Right. I mean, just to, to, to be, to be blunt about some of the questions that I get. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have any kind of a crystal ball to begin to, to know when, if what have you, but I, I kind of, I, I view it a little bit differently. Right. Um, it's, uh, I know what I need to be doing now. Right. And I know what I continue uh, to within the context or whatever energy and resources that I have, I know what I need to be doing now to, to try and make a difference. Uh, and then in terms of the time frame, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll use, a, 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 you know, an earthly uh, experience to kind of articulate this point. I, I taught some classes at International Space University in Strasbourg uh, last summer uh, and in uh, Strasbourg, France. And over in, in Strasbourg, they have this beautiful cathedral, just absolutely stunning. Uh, it almost takes your breath away because this thing was built by, by human hands with no modern technology. And so when you come upon it, you just like, oh my gosh. Uh, and then when you hear the history of it, this uh, they started building the Strasbourg Cathedral in 1100 AD and they didn't finish it until 1700, right? So the so think about that, right? Yeah, so the, the yeah. people that worked on the basement had no hope of seeing the finished, uh, the, the finished cathedral. Uh, they could only imagine it but they knew they had to do their part on the basement of the foundation, whatever they were working on. So that the next yeah. generation could do what they're doing and the next generation. Right. And so sometimes I think, you know, we, we talk about the value of working together in the here and now, and that is absolutely paramount and, and important. But I think the other thing we need to maybe remind ourselves of, especially in a day and age where we get upset, if somebody doesn't text us back in five minutes, and went, hello, you know, yeah. it's just the impatience that we have because of technology. We need to be able to work together generation to generation. So who knows? As you said, I mean, this could be 100 years. It could be more. Who knows? Right. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, we know what we need to be doing next. And in the process of continuing to push capabilities, we always find ways to use that uh, in, in, to, to benefit everybody else. Right. And it's it's like when it when you really think about the whole premise of exploration, in general, right? The, the premise of exploration is like you got a, a bunch of, think way back 50,000 years ago, you got a, a bunch of folks sitting around a campfire and they're, they're, they're talking and maybe eight of the, nine of the 10 folks that are around the campfire are engaged. And one of the, one of the 10 folks is kind of looking off in the distance, wondering, hmm, 
wonder what's over there, right? There's just something in them that makes, hmm, I wonder what's over there. And so maybe they'll, they'll go check that out and, hey, wow, geez, there's a really nice, cool river that goes through here. And we've really been struggling to find water. And so this person will come back and it'll, it'll tell the rest of the folks uh, around the campfire, hey, man, I found this really neat thing over here. And so the premise of exploration, I think, is this evolutionary thing that helps us uh, be motivated to go try and find things that make things better for the rest of the group. So. Yeah, and I think that's what really excites me about about NIAC specifically and the and the role that I think I would prefer NASA play more of <clears throat> like NASA's job in my mind is is to be just outside what government or what 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 business is it can afford is willing to invest in their job mm -hmm. is to take is to the exploration to take the things which are unknown which seem to be almost impossible and to try to make some kind of progress and then pass along those ideas. And we see, you know, there are so many benefits that have come from, from NASA, from space exploration, but in times it feels like it loses its way and goes, no, 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 we, we need to build a giant rocket just like we've built a, a giant rocket 50 years ago, even though there are other companies who build giant rockets and we could just pay them for giant rocket services. <laughs> When since, since I'm no, since I'm no longer employed by NASA, I can go, yeah. hey, I agree with you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You're allowed to agree with me. And I am not employed by NASA either. So we can, you right. know, and, and, and yet when you see the stuff coming out from NIAC, you see a hundred thousand dollars spent to investigate a really amazing idea for a telescope or a really amazing idea for a propulsion system or or oh. even ways to keep humans in space and be you know safer. It definitely oh. feels like that that role. But NASA has like the bottomless funding of the government and business right. is looking to make a profit. And the second warp drives are profitable, business will be all over this. Right, but, right, but, right, but, right. but you stand in this very precarious place where there is no business case. Mm -hmm. You don't right. have the limitless, pardon the pun, um, pockets of the American government. Right. And yet the kinds of things that you're trying to do will span out over decades, possibly centuries. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think the, the funders have the stomach for that? Well, you know, I, I, I want to, you, you got, you got two, uh, two perspectives here. I'd like to speak on. I think the first one is, you know, in, in terms of what's, what's potentially the role of a municipal organization, right. To NASA. What the role of a municipal organization in terms of fostering a particular domain uh, that it, it, it's a, it's a chief warrant holder uh, for, and I, I tend to agree very strongly with you that uh, I think um, organization an organization like NASA uh, they should be uh, spending the time, effort, money, resources, whether it's you know internal R and D, external funded. I think it all probably should be could be better if it were external funded, um, but. Uh, Planting this, planting and feeding the seed corn, if you will, of technologies that the commercial sector can't build a business case around, right? Uh, because in the process of doing that, uh, new ideas and new concepts have, you know, risk reduction and potentially provide mechanisms for them to be adopted by the commercial sector, which then may be uh, very, very useful, right? Because you're absolutely right when it comes to a business, right? You know, what's the, what's the rate of return, yeah. you know? Uh, and you've got a, a two-year, three-year horizon for those kinds of discussions. So uh, profit for a company is, is, I mean, it's it's like precious, precious gold, if you will. And so they're going to be very circumspect in, in how they expend those resources. Um, and so I, I would think uh, an organization like NASA could really benefit if it were to maybe rethink about how it uh, expends the resources that it, it expends. Uh, I've always been uh, strongly in favor of the DARPA model, right? Mm -hmm. Where you've got, uh, uh, in, in some cases, and I like the way DARPA does it because they have program managers uh, that roll in and roll out of the organization every every three to four years, and they come from uh, academia, they come from industry, and so they are uh, folks that have a lot of salt on them. They've been in the lab, or they've written some code, or you know, they understand the very areas that they're trying to represent. Uh, but they don't stick around too long, so that precludes potentially some entrenchment uh, uh, that might occur. Uh, but they, more importantly, they fund 6.1, right? Basic research. 
Uh, DARPA will fund basic research. You have DARPA Defense Science Office specifically. Uh, whereas, you know, I've, I've, I've chatted with, uh, uh, you know, Ron Turner and Ron Litchford at, uh, at NASA. Ron Turner is, of course, a, uh, a big, uh, big person with the NIAC program. Uh, but um, the NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate does not have basic research. There is no 6.1 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, call. So that, uh, that's something that they have to be aware of in the process of trying to think about things that they could find. You actually have to have a TRL number as opposed to, uh, we're, you know, we're trying to do establish proof of principle of, of, of something, right? So um, now going back, you said something about, you know, stomach for the long term. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that that depends upon... A 501c3 is like anything else. There's a give get process, yep. right? Uh, and so, uh, it is something important for somebody to potentially give up themselves in such a way as that they feel like they're they're leaving an impact? Uh, you know, the Perimeter Institute in Canada is an amazing example of that. Um, that's a nonprofit that was established, I think, almost 20 years ago. Uh, their primary donor was the founder of BlackBerry. Uh, he donated uh, 100 million dollars to them, and I think a couple of his uh, Colleagues at BlackBerry uh, donated forty million dollars, and they've, you know, they've been they've been hard at it, working on theoretical physics for, for twenty years, and they've only gotten bigger and more successful. Yeah. Um, but they have no product at all whatsoever. I mean, right, this is just theoretical basic physics. physics research. Yeah, yeah, it's at true. Best you okay. sell, at best, you can sell coffee cups and T-shirts with neat stuff on the front that they're putting on their black. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and maybe some TED talks. Okay. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. All right. I, I think you got me there. Um, yeah. You know, I think if there's a way to have an, like an endowment that just continues on, I, I've, I've had this thought for a while that, that, that we're always waiting for the people in charge to solve the problems that excite us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know if you know, I was, I, I was part of the X prize for a while. I was the product manager for hero X. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I was. And, and Anusha's on our board, by the way, she's on our board. Of oh, great. Yeah. And we did a, we did a bunch of, of projects with NASA and they still do them a lot of prizes. And I really liked this idea of kind of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing basic research into mm -hmm. these, into these kinds of, of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I actually sort of as a, as an experiment set up a von Neumann probe crowdfund, um, just to see if, you know, what could we do in, in how, like how much of a robot can we make build a copy of its, of itself? And, <laughs> um, and I think that, that it's kind of an interesting idea. My, my, I worry, are there, is it sort of like the problem with saving animals? Like, you know, you get the, the charismatic animals, but we don't necessarily have the nuts and bolts. We don't get the the leeches and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the you know what I mean? You've got to save the possums. Yeah, right? you got to save the possums. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're very rare, very ugly plants that need some protection. And I wonder in in the field of, of research, like, again, you know, you've got the warp drive there as the incentive for people to go, yeah, I want that Star Trek future. But the reality is that there are thousands of nuts and bolts problems that need solving that come along with that. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you mentioned the docking evasive maneuvers, the getting to and from your spaceship, the materials right. involved, the, the atmosphere control that goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you, do you sort of see a role in all of that stuff in, in humanity's future in space? Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure I'm checking so, the exact like, question. You know, you asked. guys are focused, you guys are focused on the, on the, the time energy problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But that is just one. It, it Every time you create a faster engine, it creates a just a enormous number of other issues that now need to be solved mm -hmm. in terms of keeping human, human beings in space for longer periods of time, et cetera. How do mm -hmm. we solve those problems? <clears throat> so that's, uh, I, I think I understand your, your question, right? Maybe I could rephrase it. Uh, it is... Can I potentially defend my hierarchical hierarchical preference? I don't know if I said or that or right, how I guess or practice. how do you hope an ecosystem right. develops that can support all of the downstream issues that need to be solved, in addition okay. to better propulsion systems? Okay, so I I, okay, I think I better understand where, where you're coming from. Uh, you know, having worked on the human exploration architecture. 
uh, architectures, um, the you know the, the gateway station is is an example of something, right? And, and the process of uh, trying to look at things that we could do in the grand scheme of things, the, the weakest area <clears throat> in terms of trying to uh, move mass around, right, or, or do anything with mass in in, in space is propulsion. Right? Yeah, I say power and propulsion, but I can just simply say propulsion because it's that. Uh, again, that, that time distance thing. When we were looking at missions we could potentially do with uh, with Gateway and some of the earlier stuff that never made it out of the uh, the bunker where we were doing work, right? It was we were always hyper limited by propulsion. Mm. All the other systems, right? They can they can they can adapt to the battery conditions with with little problems, but it was always the propulsion system that had the biggest challenges uh, to try and close some of these things, right? At one point, we even looked at. Uh, what if we wanted to go service uh, James Webb Telescope at Sun Earth L2? We didn't have enough gas in the tank. We didn't have, didn't have enough power to close it, right? Uh, it was, again, a limitation of, of propulsion, right? And, and, that's, and that's, not, that's not because we can't potentially come up with other things to, to do. Uh, in that particular architecture, we were challenged to try and piece together a spacecraft uh, with as minimal new stuff as we could possibly do to try and keep costs uh, uh, under control, right? So in, in all of my experience of, of doing uh, work with human exploration architectures, it was the propulsion system that was the, the huh. issue, right? And it, it it's almost like it sets the boundary conditions for all the other systems, right? You could, you could, uh, you could work on all these other systems, but it's immaterial until you define right. that propulsion system that tells you how long you have to get from here to here, and then that, that establishes everything else. Right. Everything else. So, in terms of the hierarchical dependency, that's like pin number one that you got to put on the, uh, the little cork board, and then everything flows from that. Okay. Okay. And that's interesting. Like I interviewed someone about uh, mining on the moon, and you know, mm -hmm. he was saying, like, you know, the first problem that you have to deal with is energy. The second problem mm -hmm. that you have to deal with is energy, and the third problem that you have to deal with is energy, and and I <laughs> and I think it's it's sort of similar, right? Which is that you know just translate that to propulsion. Like the the top three problems are propulsion, yeah. and so the rest of it. What is, is, what is it that that's a lo, was in re reality? It's location, location, location. And yeah. When you're in space, it's propulsion, propulsion, propulsion. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. So, place your bets. Um, when do you think that we send our first robotic mission to attempt to actually go to another star system? You're going to try and pin me down on a specific date, aren't you? <laughs> you have, you know, now you're, you're, I, this is, you're a free man now. You, you, you yeah. know, you get to, and I said, to just place your, what's your gut telling you? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, the stuff that, uh, breakthrough initiatives is pretty interesting with the beam energy propulsion. Uh, you know, that's certainly known physics, uh, but they, they do have some, some significant engineering challenges. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to answer your question in levels, right? I, I, I'm hopeful that we will potentially see nuclear electric propulsion in space at some point in time in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, and then, you know, that, that really, I think, as a capability, that really expands our, our presence in the solar system because we'll... Like, like every other capability we develop, as soon as we develop it, we use it to its fullest extent. And NEP is enabling and extensible uh, throughout the entire solar system. And so maybe we'll see interstellar precursors with NEP where we try and go out to the solar gravitational lens. Uh, right. Uh, goodness gracious, if we find that there's another large planet in the solar system, it's really far out there that may provide another beautiful destination for some kind of a- Or even just the interstellar propulsion. mission. Just out into the you know a thousand AU, mm -hmm. right? Without, yeah. yeah, the interstellar precursor, the one tau mission, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and then I think to you know fusion. When I was when I was uh, finishing up my PhD in physics, right? Fusion is the was always going to be the, the, the power source of the future, right? Always will be. Um, however, uh, I think there's been a, a significant change in some of the supporting technology uh, for the idea of fusion, specifically the superconductors. Rebco high temperature superconductors have changed the game uh, and have increased the potential magnitude of magnet, a magnetic field that we can realize in a magnetically confined toroidal fusion reactor. Uh, and so you've got, instead of having to build a, a 10 story tall reactor like they're doing the ITER, which was based on old superconducting technology with five Tesla capability in the middle of the plasma, this Rebco can hit 20 Tesla in the middle of the plasma. And so 
we can have reactors that are one one hundred the volume wow. feature. So uh, uh, Commonwealth Fusion, which is a, a commercial spinoff company from MIT, uh, they're working on the Spark reactor. They just closed their Series B funding round, which is like one point two billion. That's a Series B. Yeah, one point yeah. the B one point two billion for a Series B. That I, that's I can't even comprehend that. But they may potentially have uh, a, a a physics demonstration plant uh, that has a physics coefficient of performance uh, of about five to 10. Uh, and that would be something that's, you know, tiny compared to ITER. And they may be coming online long before uh, ITER does. Uh, there are a couple other organizations, Gen you know, General Fusion has an yep. approach that they're looking at, Tokamak Energy. Uh, I think there's another Trialpha, Helion. There's a, a whole bunch of them that are out there. They're taking advantage of uh, new approaches and, and changes in technology from the assumptions that were made in the 90s. So I think we'll see terrestrial fusion generating power on the grid in the next 10 years, maybe, right? Um, and if we if we have it in a terrestrial sense, we'll certainly potentially try and find ways to map it to on orbit. And so with fusion propul propulsion in space, you can send large payloads to another star system instead of just a you know a five meter sail that's less than a gram or less than a kilo way less than a kilogram only maybe a few grams, if you will. Um, and that, I, I would anticipate that would potentially happen before the turn of the century, right? Uh, All right, there you go. Future. 78 years. You just predicted it. Okay, you got 70, 70 you 77 years. You pinned me down. I did. You well, you, me down. You fell <laughs> for the trap. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and when do you think humans? Uh, well, I mean, technically with, with fusion, you could do you could potentially do humans. You just have to be prepared to be patient. Uh, I don't I don't know what has to happen to make something like that really possible. Uh, uh, but um, if we, in the process of looking at the frontiers of physics, if we can, is, can we potentially push off of the fabric of space time, like a, a space drive? Arthur C. Clarke coined the term quantum vacuum ramjet, right? What if you have some way to impart momentum on some background field, right? Then uh, uh, you, you could potentially have a nuclear electric propulsion system where there's a space drive and that could do a human mission to another star system in, in a little less than a super long period of time. Uh, uh, right. And of course, the space warp is the romantic vision. Who knows? I don't know. I, have, I wouldn't begin to predict uh, by the end of the century or not. Uh, but um, anyway, so yeah, those may be some things that, uh, so the, think of it this way, right? The, the third most swim lane is definitely disruptive. And it, things are called disruptive for a reason because we didn't anticipate it. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, those are and those ideas are firmly in the in the third uh, category. Um, I know so, physics. Yeah. yeah. So so Sonny, if people want to get involved, um, and especially someone willing to donate mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars, uh, yeah, what's right. the to to the future of of what is right. the best way for people to get involved in in your project? So we've got a website, uh, limitlessspace.org. Uh, you can you can contact. We have an email uh, connection through there. Um, and then, I mean, if you, if somebody wanted to donate, we have a button you can click to, to make donations as well, but, um, uh, always happy to support discussions. I get a, a lot of, uh, uh, requests from folks to ask questions about what do I need to study in school that helps me be more effective, potentially maybe work on, uh, some or all of those three swim lanes. And so always happy to support those things. We'll happily come give talks at, uh, schools and organizations, uh, and so forth. We, we do have a really nice video too that we pieced together. Uh, that three swim lane thing you kind of heard. Yeah. We did a artistic version of it. That yeah. We all incredibly fast. Yeah. A I'm, beautiful piece. I'm. I'm. It, it is beautiful, but I felt a little manipulated by that video. I'm not gonna lie. Hmm. Really? I, well, it just it just felt like it was just like drawing on every science fiction fantasy that that you know that I've got. Yeah, I would. Yes, please. Let's definitely go faster than the speed of light and, and, and blast off across the, the cosmos. That sounds wonderful. But I, but I, you know, and I think it, it feels to me like, like those are that, that third lane, although interesting and should be a part of the portfolio. The thing that I find really interesting is, is the other two, the, and especially the, you know, the ones where we know this is working, but there just hasn't been this investment into it or there or just there are stakeholders aren't willing to risk their spacecraft on this platform. And yet it would solve a lot of the mission parameters and, and criteria. And it definitely mm -hmm. feels like that plus extending ideas that we do already understand 
there's so much fertile ground there that Three, I don't, right? that I yeah. don't think you need to to draw upon the the Star Trek analogies, even though that is very inspiring. And so, well, I you know, so I'll, I'll I'll push back on you. Sure. Right? So I, I understand your perspective, and I respect that. Right. A lot of folks like to live within the context of, of known physics. And I completely respect that. And, and point in fact, it is a major part of our portfolio for the very reasons that you mentioned, right? Uh, the known physics at least takes one potential degree of freedom out of the out of the, the unknown thing that we're, we're struggling with. And so uh, in terms of things that we need to try and uh, advocate for and, and work on, those are very, very important, right? My, my experience at NASA uh, is endemic of, of all of that stuff, right? I served on the nuclear systems working group, advocated for the development of nuclear power, because I think that's an important capability for us to try and develop. Uh, certainly extremely interested in, in fusion and hopeful to see that continue to develop and definitely want to advocate for it. And you see in the stuff that we're funding, we're funding that, no question, right? Absolutely. Uh, but I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a physicist and I, my PhD is in physics. You know, I, I, I study tensor calculus for fun. I like general relativity. Um, you know, I do quantum field theory calculations. Uh, and so I like thinking about that other unsolved problem. And so while you might you might say I like this because it's just unknown engineering, not unknown physics. I'm a physicist, so I'm okay with the fact that there's also unknown science, right? And so in that in that physics Venn diagram, that's a the, that's a problem that needs to be solved. And so I'm very interested in trying to uh, chew on that dog bone, if you will. And so I get satisfaction of trying to figure out how you know. We've got this math that's really useful and this math that's really useful, but they're not compatible other than just the fact they touch at a tangent point, right? And so why is that the case? And, and that and that that really fuels myself and a, a large number of other folks that are just like, you know, you're extremely interested in the engineering side, right? And I, I salute that and appreciate that. I'm interested in the engineering side and the science side. And I and, and in no way could I imagine that it's uh, it's not okay to try and chew on that, that frontiers of science. That's how we figure things out. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. Wasn't yeah, no here argument here at the beginning of the twentieth century, right? I mean, think about it. You know, I said e equals mc squared. Special relativity and general relativity, right? Right at the turn of the twentieth century, it was here, and look what we've. I mean, heck, we've got GPS as our. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right we've yeah. got GPS as a result of that, right? And so the only reason that that was uh, that was worked on is because somebody recognized, hey, we need to we need to, that whole that other circle didn't even exist. Right. So we got to work on the other stuff as well. And so I think I would I would propose to you that it might be a little bit a little bit too much of a blinder to say, well, I, I, I don't want to think about that. Wait, hold on. Well, we already have precedents. Right. We're working on the frontiers of physics has changed our, you know, our technological society for the better. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely didn't want to come across as being against investigating pushing the, the realms of, of physics. I think mm -hmm. I applaud that, that you're including that component into it as well. Um, and, and it's as like, I get that it's aspirational that, mm -hmm. that having the, having the potential of, and, and, and ideas from for warp drives that have not been sent by people who haven't done the math, but actually have been done by people who have done the math is, mm -hmm. is, is very exciting. And, um, and I, and I can definitely appreciate that. Like I said, it's just like when I saw the video, I'm like, oh, they're leaning pretty hard on the, the, that third lane mm -hmm. when the other two lanes are, are to me as equally as, as exciting. So, um, but I totally get, you know, it's a, it's a way to inspire people and provide that, that aspirational objective mm -hmm. right? while at the same time helping to educate and inform and, and be able to drive money down into basic research across the system. So, so yeah, well, no. I think there's, you know, there's, there's another, the, the, if you think about it, so the, the purpose of uh, the three swim lanes, right, which is what the, the video was born from, is to try and communicate, because a lot of people just don't even know, right? They, they, they really, they haven't thought about it very much, so they don't even understand. Uh, and so it's a way to try and, as we kind of talked at the beginning of this discussion, this is super complicated topic. Right, and there's a lot of moving parts, and it's there's a lot of, a lot of subtleties and, and nuances, and so it's a way to try and, and take a very large, complicated thing and put it into some bite-sized chunks uh, that some people can potentially connect with, right? And so the the the, the verbal stuff that you heard from me is uh, you know the, 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 a summary of that, 
And then the video is just an artistic way to highlight it. Now, I don't think we're trying to highlight one versus the other. They're all three part of our thought process, right? Nuclear electric propulsion is absolutely enabling for human exploration of our solar system, right? And, and that's the way we say it in the video. It's, it, we, can, we can take human beings to every, every world in our solar system. Uh, but, you know, 2,000 years to another uh, star, that's kind of a long time. So uh, yeah. what else could we do, right? And so then that's the, so the, the, the video is trying to connect the dots, not necessarily kind of point one particular direction over the, or another, if you will. So, yeah. so anyway, so, I appreciate your comments on it. So I have one last question, which is, where are all the warp travelers? So, you know, you take the Fermi paradox and mm -hmm. you – and and we wonder where all the aliens are. And I think one mm -hmm. basic assumption of that is that they're moving at or below the speed of light. If mm -hmm. warp drives are possible, then you would assume that that alien civilizations out there have developed them. Mm -hmm. That makes the Fermi paradox even more troubling. So where are they? Right. So the, uh, I, have, I have two answers. One is I tend to be generally agnostic to that whole topic, but uh, I want to talk about the Drake equation, right? Because, uh, you know, your, your, your narrative is uh, predicated on the, 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 the assumption that there's a lot of uh, uh, societies out there uh, that could potentially generate uh, some kind of advanced propulsion technology. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be visiting us. Go, go quickly, right? Um, uh, you know, the, their, the Drake equation has a lot of really neat variables that kind of uh, summarize all the statistical odds uh, that something is as complicated, uh, analog analogously complicated as a human being with intelligence and motivation akin to a human being and the, the desire and capability to then leave their planet and then with the desire and capability to potentially go somewhere else, right? And so uh, the, the, if some of those if some of those uh, factors are low, and I tend to usually rank all those numbers low, <laughs> Uh, then there's probably nobody nearby us anyway, yeah. right? Uh, num number one, number two, there's the, there's also this time uh, frame of existence, right? In terms of our did this did this other civilization come to the capability where they could do that, or before they went away and all evidence of them went away after eons and millions or billions of years of, of what have you? So I. I First off, I'm predominantly agnostic, but secondly, I tend to be very conservative on those yeah. factors that go into the Drake equation. And so my uh, 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 my estimation on odds of SETI picking things up uh, tend to be kind of really low anyway. So, the, so the, the solar system isn't filled with alien warp vessels because they're very far away. I, I uh, again, I'm agnostic and I, t I tend to, to lean towards no. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, well absolutely fascinating um you know do you f from a from a journalist standpoint how are you guys communicating the like like when not when nasa nyack releases a new tranche of of awards mm. they do mm. a great press release and they list out all the various mm. projects and then we for 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 universe today that is catnip to us we cover mm. a lot of those stories and mm -hmm. put a lot of resources and energy into that. So right. do you right. have plans to make the various projects that you're funding available in a way that that we can stay on top of them? Yeah, great question, Fraser. We we do put out uh, – pre we, so like the 2020-2022 the cycle, we put out a press release that highlighted the, the folks that won the, the different grants – uh, when we did the uh, the kickoff meeting, the midterm meeting, and the final meeting, we did all those uh, on Zoom and live on YouTube as well. So uh, anyone could have watched it, uh, yep. can watch it. We recorded it all, recorded all the proceedings. All those proceedings are on our YouTube channel. So I think if you Google Limitless Space Institute YouTube, you'll come to our channel. We have all the briefings from the nine different teams. Uh, where they talked about what they were going to do at the kickoff, and then they talked about where they were in the midterm, and then we wrap things up with a finale. And we'll do the exact same thing with this next round of uh, LSI grants, where we'll we'll publicly broadcast uh, anything and everything as much as we can. Fantastic. I mean, if something were to come up where somebody had some issue, we, we, we'd have to salute their request. But in the solicitation, we tell them up front, we want to communicate this as, as publicly and as, as freely as we can. So 
uh, work with us to try and make that possible. So terrific, yeah, yeah. Like I said, that is uh, that is definitely the kinds of stories that we love to cover at Universe today. So so we'll make sure that we stay on top of the of the new projects that you guys fund because it's pretty exciting stuff. Well, uh, Sonny, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's pretty exciting. You're gonna help us all live the science fiction dream that. That we've all had since, since children. And if you do mm -hmm. get a, a, a warp drive working, please let me know. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks, Fraser. I appreciate all it. Right. It's good to see you again. Buddy. Good to see you too. All right. Take care. All right. See you.